Good afternoon, and welcome to today's Friday Forum at the City Club of Cleveland. My name is Courtney Diorio, and I'm the club's president. The City Club is the country's oldest continuous free speech forum. Earlier this week, the governor of New York, George Pataki, spoke at this podium about the rebuilding effort still underway in Lower Manhattan five years after September 11th. During his remarks, he reflected on the massive response and recovery effort that was mobilized in the hours, days, weeks, and months after this horrific disaster. He cited extremely well-organized and coordinated efforts within the city and state governments, which provided the basis for the integration of federal resources, including those from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, the agency charged with responding to, planning for, recovering from, and mitigating against disasters. A particularly poignant part of Governor Pataki's talk was when he, when he recalled another deadly disaster that occurred during his term as governor. In 1996, TWA Flight 800 crashed into the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Long Island shortly after takeoff from Kennedy Nas International Airport. The airplane was destroyed and there were no survivors among the 230 people destined for Paris, France that day. It was clear by not only the words of Governor Pataki that he chose, that, but by the emotion in his voice that he was not as prepared for this disaster as he had been in 2001. What also came across was the determination in his voice to be prepared the next time. The response and recovery at Ground Zero, Ground Zero was clearly a realization of this vow. Despite this extraordinary display of preparation, coordination, and communication, it was felt by many that more was needed. In response to 9-11, President Bush established the Department of Homeland Security. The goal of this department is to leverage resources within federal, state, and local governments, coordinating the transition of multiple agencies and programs into a single integrated agency focused on protecting the American people. More than 87,000 different governmental jur jurisdictions at the federal, state, and local level have Homeland Security responsibilities. FEMA became part of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security on March 1, 2003. This reorganization prompted the then director, Joe Abba, to leave the agency. His successor was Michael Brown, FEMA's deputy director, who had also joined the agency when President Bush was elected. With this newly configured department in place and a new director in charge, we faced yet another massive disaster. On August 28, 2005, Category 3, Hurricane Katrina, hit the coasts of Louisiana and Mississippi. More than 1,800 people were killed, and damages are estimated at $81.2 billion, making Katrina our costliest nat natural disaster. While we know that Michael Brown resigned 10 days after President Bush commended him for a job well done, what we may not know is that Homeland Security Secretary Michael Chertoff asked Mr. Brown to stay on for 30 days because he felt Brown's expertise was needed. One year later, Michael Brown is here to share what happened behind closed doors before and after the storm hit, how the weakened state of FEMA post 9-11 led to its unpreparedness, and what it will take to avert this kind of disaster in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Michael Brown. Thank you, Courtney. She had me a little bit worried about that introduction. She wouldn't show it to me, and she said she had done a extensive research, and I think she was right on the spot for that. Thank you very much. It is indeed an honor and a privilege to speak before this august body today, Jim, and thank you for inviting me and, and having me here. Uh, I want to thank Mayor Debbie Sutherland for inviting me to uh, come to Cleveland, a place I've often traveled on the south side of or been through the airport, but have never been downtown. So it's been quite a day to come and, and see Cleveland as it really is. I was also appreciative of a book that Jim gave me, and I was thumbing through it just before I got up here today because I wanted to see if my hero had ever stood at this lectern and talked to this group, and he had, Theodore Roosevelt. A lot of people like to stand up and say that, you know, their hero is TR, and TR stands for this, and if you really study TR's life, he can stand for just about anything. But I had the honor and the privilege of serving on the Board of, of Trustees of the Theodore Roosevelt Association, so I feel like having studied him and having served on the association as a trustee, I can speak a little more, I hope authoritatively, about what TR stood for. 
but I'm not going to today. Instead, I want to give you a story about TR that I think is applicable to what I want to discuss and is certainly applicable to my life and what I've gone through uh, the past 12, 14 months. The story is probably anecdotal, but I like to believe that it's true. And the story goes like this, that he and John Muir are out on one of their wild hunting trips where Theodore is shooting everything in sight and collecting every bug that he can find and keeping a journal and, and just wearing everybody out with his enthusiasm and his get-go and always moving and doing things. And at the end of the day, he and John Muir, imagine this, I mean, the President of the United States and John Muir, two great Americans, sitting around a campfire, eating beans, you know, and telling lies to each other and talking about what they've done, done all day long. And pretty soon, John Muir's had all he can take of, Theo, of Theodore, and he goes, come on, let's go to bed. And TR says, no, just a minute. And for those of you who are old enough in the room to remember Carl Sagan, I can just picture TR in this kind of Carl Sagan voice talking about, and everybody be still and be quiet for a minute. And then TR would start describing the billions and billions of galaxies and all of the stars that exist out there. And he would go on for several minutes. And at some point, he would reach exhaustion. He would say, OK, now that we feel sufficiently small, we can go to bed. Now, I love that story because it's got political connotations, sociological connotations, theological connotations. Every kind of connotation can be used in almost any context. But at the heart of the story is this. We are all guided by our perspective. And so today, I hope to give you a little different perspective than what you may or may not have about the 12, last 12 or 14 months in the life of Michael Brown. There are a lot of emails floating around. I would challenge anyone in this room to be willing to take their server, their hard drive, and give it to the New York Times or the Washington Post and say, here. Here are all the emails I've sent all of my friends, or here are emails that I had no control over, but a friend sent me. Publish them. Read them. Show them to the country. And let the country make a judgment based on those emails. I remember one in particular, a press secretary that I ended up having to terminate, had emailed someone that was actually in the Superdome, busy with the medical team trying to do stuff. Leave Mr. Brown alone. He's tired, needs to get something to eat. Well, you know what? I probably was tired, and I probably was a little grumpy because I was hungry, but she certainly didn't need to put that in an email on a government computer that at some point someone could file a Freedom of Information request and have published by the Washington Post and the New York Times. Because now people, the headline then becomes, Brown doesn't care about victims, Brown only cares about dinner. And it even went so far then to talk about not only did Brown care about dinner, but he went to Ruth's Chris. Man, I wish I had. <laughs> I wish I had. You see, we're all governed by perspective. We're all governed by what we see or hear and that we take at face value. My kids who are old enough to, or young enough to still stay up late and watch Saturday Night Live or to watch the David Letterman show would occasionally call me and say, Dad, last night Letterman was really beating you up. OK, tell me the joke. Yeah. It's like, it's like telling a lawyer a lawyer joke. Yeah, I've heard that one, you know. Tell me something new. So that became the perspective. But how quickly perspective can change, because this country and all of us have become so addicted to the visual. I knew in my heart what I had done prior to Katrina and during Katrina. But there was nothing visual to show that until a reporter from the Associated Press decided to make a Freedom of Information request to FEMA to get a copy of the videotapes prior to Katrina making landfall where I was briefing the president and our teams about what need, needed to be done. And on those videotapes, you'll see a Michael Brown, the same guy I'm standing before you today, saying, I'm concerned about the Superdome. I don't think it can withstand a Category 3, let alone a Category 5 hurricane. I'm concerned because the mayor has, made, has not evacuated people out of nursing homes, out of hospitals, that the mayor has not taken the right positions to get people out as quickly as possible. 
I'm concerned about the lack of communications. If the storm comes up and goes across Lake Pontchartrain and slows down enough, that even if the levees don't breach, the levees will be topped and the fishbowl effect will take, in, will take place anyway. And you, tell, you hear me tell the staff and all of the other agencies represented by the Department of Transportation, and Health and Human Services, and others, that I expect them to push the envelope. And I even go so far as to say that if you have to push the envelope over the edge, that's fine. Do what you have to do. Just come and tell me so I can take the blame for it and I can justify it for you. In other words, it's balls to the wall. Everything we need to do, pull out all stops in this response. And then I fly to Baton Rouge, and I am shocked by what I find. You see, I think about, I'll give you two quick examples. One, I go to Florida in 2004. Florida's hit by four successive hurricanes, the first time in over 100 years. And when I land in Punta Gorda, Florida, I meet up with Governor Bush, and he and I walk in with his emergency manager and with my federal coordinating officer into a command center. And we make the decision about here's what FEMA will do and here's what the state of Florida will do. What are the needs? What do we have to do to make this thing happen? And boom, we go and we start working. Go back a year before that. I fly into San Diego, California. And I use this example because people will look at me and say, well, you use Jeb as an example because he's the president's brother and he's a Republican and you and Jeb are friends and yada, yada, yada. BS. Let me give you another example. I fly into San Diego, California, where a significant wildfire has broken out. And the state of California is unable to get this fire under control. And I fly into a political situation that I've never seen in my life, or at least never had to interact with in my life. I walk in, and I've got a governor and a governor-elect. But it's even more interesting than that. The outgoing governor is going out because he's been recalled by the state of California. So I have on one hand Gray Davis, the guy who's now been beat up, recalled for incompetence or whatever. And on the other side, an aspiring actor named Arnold Schwarzenegger, who has decided that he's going to become the governor of California and fix everything. What an interesting dichotomy to have those two men sitting on both sides of me, and now we've got to go figure out how to get California under control and put out this wildfire before it spreads into the, the urban parts of San Diego. But we do it because we go in and we sit down and we divide up the responsibilities and things happen. I fly into Baton Rouge and I can't even find an incident command system. I ask a governor what the needs are, what do you need? I don't get answers. My federal coordinating officer in Baton Rouge comes to me and says, I can't find out what's going on in the field. Yet I have an urban search and rescue team in the Superdome. I have a national disaster medical team in the Superdome. But they call me later that day to tell me they're leaving the Superdome because the press is now reporting that people are being shot from the rooftops. Men and women are being raped. Children are being raped. There is nothing but total civil disturbance civil disobedience, and total anarchy in the Superdome. So an urban search and rescue team, with all due respect to the USAR, makes the decision that in order to protect themselves, they must evacuate the Superdome. Of course, we find out later, oh, the press, we're sorry. Those reports were erroneous. Yet it caused the delay in the response in the Superdome. I had demanded over 50 trucks of ice and water to the Superdome. Some of them never showed up. They're contractors. They're your neighbors. They're people that FEMA hires to go out and do these things. <coughs> what happened to them? Well, they're listening to the CB radio. They're listening to the radio, the AM stations. They hear about looting and rioting and snipers. They pull over the side of the road. They're not going to take their rigs into a situation like that. Oh, that's not true. You see how important perspective is and how it affects what happens in our day-to-day -day lives? Another perspective that I want to give you is, Courtney gave that great introduction in talking about Pataki's description of 9-11. On September 11th, Joe Albaugh and I flew back on a KC-130 from Big Sky, Montana to Washington, D.C. 
And we landed at what would have been rush hour and were escorted directly to the offices. There's no traffic and I can see the smoke rising from the Pentagon. After that, the President decides that the Department of Homeland Security needs to be created so we can better coordinate, and in fact the words are so that we have a place to coordinate all of the departments and agencies of the federal government in times of disaster, natural or man-made. That's what FEMA did for 29 years. Except now, with a new perspective, think of it this way. FEMA doesn't own trains, planes, and automobiles. At the time I left as the director of FEMA, I was authorized 2,500 full-time positions, of which 2,000 were filled. I, I had over 20% of my workforce decimated and gone. I had a $3 billion budget, about $2.5 billion of which was for direct payments to state and local governments or individuals in times of disaster. You do the calculation, it leaves me about a $500 million, slightly less than a $1 billion in operating funds. Let me give you a little perspective. The Department of Homeland Security has over 185,000 employees and a budget of $40 billion when I left. Now, who do you think gets the attention in Washington, D.C.? $40 billion? $3 billion. 187,000? 2,500. On March 3rd, 2003, I sent Tom Ridge a memo that said, if we continue down this path of marginalizing FEMA, this administration will face another Hurricane Andrew if we don't fix it and fix it now. Nothing was done. When Secretary Chertoff came in, I took the memo and I cut and pasted and changed the words and made it a little bit stronger and said, Mr. Secretary, with all due respect, if you keep going down this path of splitting preparedness from response, of taking the people who do the day-to-day -day fighting and separate them out, it will fail. The military has a saying that says you fight as you train and you train as you fight. You can't do that in the federal government if all the training's being done somewhere else and all the fighting's being done by another group that shows up someday and says, oh, hi, nice to meet you. What are we going to do here? We were doomed to failure, and I predicted that to both Secretary Ridge, to the White House, and to Secretary Chertoff. The problem is DHS is too big. And DHS has two different cultures. DHS has a culture of preventing incidents. 185,000 people whose job is to stop something from happening, to keep people from doing something bad by sneaking through TSA, or to try to keep something bad by keeping people from sneaking through our borders. We're doing a really good job of that, aren't we? And to make certain that the, that the tanker that I saw pulling into the port today has been inspected. Their job is to prevent things from happening, and FEMA's job is to be the mop-up guys and clean up when something bad happens, whether it's by terrorism and what we did successfully on September 11th, where we cleaned up ground zero ahead of schedule and under budget, or we do what happened in Katrina, where we can't get things coordinated. Let me give you a kind of a hard-nosed example. Buses. I've been blasted for not getting buses, yet buses sat in floodwaters in New Orleans. Governor Blanco asked me for 500 buses and I immediately turned to my FCO and said, get me 500 buses, I don't care what they cost, where you get them, get me 500 buses and drivers and get them down there right now. Prior to DHS, I would have turned to Debbie, my chief procurement officer, and I would have said, Debbie, I want 500 buses in New Orleans, I don't care what it costs the taxpayers, they're going to save lives, just do it and I'll cover your rear end no matter what the cost is. I'll go before Congress and justify it. That's the way it used to work. You know how it works now in Katrina? Debbie, I need 500 buses. I'll cover you. Just get them, make it happen. Okay, now Debbie's a career civil servant. Now she has to turn to the Chief Procurement Officer of the Department of Homeland Security and say, uh, Mr. Brown wants 500 buses, can we get them? Well, how much are they? What color does he want? automatic shift, whatever, come on. And then once that gets approved, that goes to the Undersecretary of Management for Homeland Security who signs off on it and then it goes to the Secretary. So what used to be direct accountability now has four or five layers of bureaucracy. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot do that kind of business in this kind of world when Al-Qaeda is sitting there laughing at us because they can change on a whim 
and yet Mike Brown's going through four or five layers of bureaucracy to get 500 buses to save American lives. It is not acceptable. I was grilled pretty hard by some members of Congress who think they're pretty smart. One congressman in general said, you know, Mr. Brown, you don't understand death and suffering. You didn't care about those people. I want to take you all back to a date that may not mean anything to any of you, but it's April 19, 1995. The day before, I had given a speech in San Diego, California, and that morning I got up in my hotel and had breakfast, was walking back to my room, and I noticed on the television monitor some story about a building in Oklahoma City that had exploded. So I went to my room and turned on the television because when I first got out of law school, I used to work in downtown Oklahoma City. In fact, I was so cheap that the Murrah building had a free two-hour parking place that I used to park in so I wouldn't have to pay the $10 a day, which I know is cheap, at the courthouse. I learned about three days after that that fortunately none of my family died, but a very close friend of mine from high school had died in the Murrah building at the hands of a domestic terrorist. So Congress don't tell me that I don't understand death and suffering from disasters. I fast forward you to, sep to uh, September 11, 2001. And I'm sure everyone in this room knows somebody that knows somebody. But I will tell you on September 12th, having spent September 11th on an airplane and in the west wing of the Oval Office trying to find out, plan out what we were going to do. On September 12th, I went with an urban search and rescue team from the Arlington Task Force into the well of the Pentagon and looked at all of the destruction and tried to imagine that and saw some of the engine parts. So you conspiracy buffs that might be listening, listening somewhere, let me assure you there were engines and there was a plane that crashed into the Pentagon. And let me tell you that a couple of days after that trip into the Pentagon, I learned that a friend of mine that I'd had dinner with two weeks before was on that plane. And I've imagined many times Barbara sitting on that plane, coming down the Potomac approach and instead of coming around the river like you normally do, screaming along at five or six hundred miles an hour in that airplane, screaming across the buildings in Arlington and screaming across Arlington National Cemetery, and Barbara knew she was going to die at the hands of foreign terrorists. Congress, I understand death and suffering, and I understand what it takes to make this country prepared. And it is time in this country that we start getting prepared and we get serious. I'm tired of seeing a mother's cough medicine taken away from her children as she goes through Dulles Airport last night because for some reason we believe that that's going to make us safer. Politicians have got to recognize that making us feel good is not what we want. That what we want is to know that we are truly working to make things safer and that we as a nation are working, whether it's in the private sector, in our schools, in our communities, wherever it is, that we're working to become more resilient. You see, because we can't be 100% safe unless we want to live in a dictatorship or we want to live in some sort of fascist country. There will always be risks. Even if we eliminate all of terrorism in the world, we'll still have the greatest terrorist of all, and that's Mother Nature. We will still face the, the disasters that come because of the technological, complex society that we live in, where we're all dependent upon our ATMs our cell phones, our PDAs, our ability to compute with other people. One substation goes out and an entire region goes black. We've got to become more resilient in this country and be serious about the kinds of approaches that we take to homeland security. What makes us safer and what makes us more resilient? You see, Mr. Congressman, I understand and predicted that what was happening in DHS was not going to work. It can work. It did work. Each of us owes a responsibility. There's a few people in this room right now that are wearing uniforms. And I've seen them all over the world. I've seen them in South Asia. I've seen them in Russia. I've seen them in East Asia. I've seen them in Canada and Mexico and Europe. The men and women who wear these uniforms, the first responders, the utility workers, the healthcare workers, these firefighters are going to do everything they can to help you and me in times of a disaster. They're going to put their lives on the line, put their lives at risk to help us. So I ask you, do you want to be that person who causes a firefighter to lose their life 
because we didn't take some personal responsibility about being better prepared ourselves. That's what we owe them. That's what we owe the country. And that's how we will beat terrorism. And that's how we'll deal with Mother Nature is by becoming more resilient. We can't allow another state like Louisiana to sit back and ignore the kind of catastrophic disaster planning that needs to be done. We've got to take the resources. We don't need a bridge to nowhere in Alaska that spends a billion dollars, thanks to Senator Stevens, God bless Senator Stevens, for doing, the, doing his work for his state, but why spend that money on that? When I had $800 million for assistance to firefighter grants and I had a demand of $3 billion, let's get our priorities straight. Getting this country prepared, getting individuals prepared, and learning to take personal responsibility for being prepared for anything that might happen in our community. I don't think terrorism is going to happen in, Col in Cleveland. I certainly hope that it doesn't. But I know Mother Nature is going to strike you. Ice storms, floods, tornadoes, fires. Someone told me this morning there was an accident on the freeway where I, I, I suppose he lost his life, but a motorcyclist that was struck or something between a, a motorcycle and an 18-wheeler shut down the freeways. You know, that could have been a chemical truck and we could have had a chemical incident. See, it doesn't take terrorism to cause the same kind of things. We have to be ready for that, and we have to demand of our government to do it, but we have to demand of ourselves that we do it too. Otherwise, there will be a lot of Katrinas in this world. So, stand up for what you believe in, do your job well, and to all these firefighters in the room, I say this, and it applies to all of us. Let's take the TR test, let's get things in perspective, and let's commit to ourselves that whether it's interaction with government, whether it's interaction with our fellow citizens, that whatever we do, we're going to be honest and upfront about it, and we're going to try to do it just a little bit better every single time. It's truly an honor to speak to all of you, and I look forward to your questions later. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we are listening to Michael Brown, the former director of the Federal Emergency Management Agency. We will return to our distinguished speaker in a moment for our traditional City Club questions. We encourage you to formulate your questions now while we break for a few announcements. We welcome all of you here and those listening to WCLV 104.9 FM or one of the many radio stations across the country that carry these City Club forums. Radio broadcasts of the City Club are made possible through the generous support of Case Western Reserve University. Our television broadcast partners are WVIZ PBS, IdeaStream, and Time Warner Cable. Television broadcasts are supported by John Carroll University, National City, and the Nords Corporation. University of Akron supports our live webcasts. Today's forum is the annual Tom and Peggy Campbell Endowed Forum, which recognizes a very generous contribution from the Campbells to the Forum Foundation Endowment. Tom served as president of the City Club in 1970, and he and Peggy have been active members for many years. Joining us today at the head table is Peggy Campbell and their son, Tom. Will both of you please stand so that we can show our appreciation? Thank you. With us today are guests at our City Club president's table, which is sponsored by the law firm of Tucker Ellison West. Each month, we invite these guests to join us for the Friday Forum experience as a way of introducing them to these excellent City Club programs. We hope they will join us in the future, and thank you to Tucker, Ellison West for their support. We would like to welcome guests at a table hosted by the Greater Cleveland Partnership. Thank you for joining us today. We are pleased to welcome our forum, to our forum today students who are here as a part of our City Club student program. Participation of these students is made possible by a generous grant from the Jeffrey David Epstein Memorial Student Fund. With us today are high school students from Brookside, Brunswick, Life Skills Center of Lake Erie, Jane Addams, Midview, Shaw, and YEOP. Now we would like to return to our speaker for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Holding the microphones today are Development Director Jessica Allen and City Club intern Tim Kovach. Now first question, please. Hi, Mr. Brown. My name is Anju Kapoor. Um, a long time ago when I was working, I've, 
I was told that it's always better to beg for forgiveness after the fact than to ask for permission. Knowing that your predictions were coming true and unraveling, what did you personally do to help facilitate the process, knowing the levels of bureaucracy that your workers had to go through? Well, as my wife reminds me about once a week, I should have quit earlier and gone public, and I wouldn't have gone through all of this. So thanks, honey, for that, that sound advice. True, but I, I've testified before Congress in many groups, and I think the biggest mistake that I made was not being honest with the American public during the very first days of Katrina. We have this horrible habit in Washington, D.C. of getting these talking points, and you speak from the talking points. Here's the message of the day. And the message of the day for the first several days was, the governor and the, and, the, and the federal government are working together as a good team. Uh, we've got XYZ assets in the field, and things are going smoothly. Baloney. What I should have said was this is a catastrophic disaster that the country is not prepared for. We need the American public to give us patience. I need people with boats. I need people with trucks. I need XYZ of people to get in to do things. And that probably would have gotten me fired anyway but it probably would have given a much, a much, much better response to the disaster. Mr. Brown, there has been considerable uh, information about your qualifications when you accepted the job as deputy uh, director. Would you give us uh, some indication, what was the pathway for you to uh, ascend, and also, uh, knowing what you know now, would you have accepted the job then? Well, let's go ahead and start with the beginning and work up to that question. Give me time to think about that. Um, I've always been puzzled by, by that uh, issue about my qualifications because I really rose uh, through the typical American way. Uh, when I got out of college, I worked as an assistant to the city manager in Edmond, Oklahoma, the fastest growing community in the state at the time. We were issuing about 1,000 building permits per month for a two or three year period. And my job at the city of Edmond was basically to oversee emergency services, the police and fire departments. Uh, I helped develop the emergency operations plans for the city of Edmond. Uh, I, I developed uh, all the budgets for the police and fire departments. So that was my genesis of emergency management. And then when I graduated from law school, I represented municipalities for about 10 or 15 years in police and fire matters and emergency services, bond issues, uh, all sorts of things. Then I was hired to go into FEMA as the general counsel. So I came to FEMA in 2001 when the president was uh, inaugurated as the general counsel and shortly after September 11th was nominated as the deputy director. That confirmation was, uh, that uh, appointment was confirmed by the Senate later in um, 2002. So I in essence worked my way up through the organization. Um, you, you succeed in any business, I suppose, with the exception of brain surgery, by one, having a knowledge of the topic, the subject matter, and surrounding yourself by experts who can help you do the job. Uh, there's no question in my mind that I was qualified. I had successfully led over 160 presidential disaster declarations. Uh, had, as general counsel, obviously had oversight of everything in terms of government policies and procedures and regulations of FEMA. So yes, I was qualified. But what people like to do is to say, well, how did he go from being the commissioner of the International Arabian Horse Association, which was one of my clients, to becoming the director of FEMA? And they leave out all of the prior stuff and all of the middle stuff. Would I take the job again? I don't know. But I want to say to these young people in the room, there is no, no greater satisfaction than doing public service. I encourage all of you in whatever avenue you take in life, to take some time out to serve your country. Whether that's at state, local, or municipal level, wherever it is, serve your country. We need guys like you. Mr. Brown, you've indicated you don't think that relieving a mother of cough syrup she's carrying for her children will improve airline safety. What do you know of the current use of profiling and what do you think of an increased use of profiling? Well, I don't know what they're doing, truthfully. All I see right now is what I observe um, at the airports. I will tell you that um, as much as I abhor racial profiling, it seems to me that we've now been attacked by 19 uh, Muslims between the ages of what is it, 19 and 34, and we don't need to be you know, searching my grandmother or whatever, just make sure her toothpaste is not some sort of, of chemical device. Um, there are ways 
there are technologies out there that will identify the technologies. Let me even back up further. There are dogs out there. <laughs> I don't understand why we don't, why we don't use dogs more so than we do now because they're acceptable as evidence in court. They clearly are trainable. The British are now looking at, tra hold on, I'm not gonna make this up. The British are looking at being able to train bees to recognize certain chemical substances. So why don't we get more smarter about using technology and using things around that will detect these things and go after those few who are the criminals instead of making us all criminals in hopes of catching one or two. If we do that, we can do it without racial profiling. Uh, Mr. Brown, uh, after 9-11, everybody realized one of, one of the biggest problems was that we couldn't communicate with each other, uh, interoperability as they call it. That still is a problem in this country. We know how to fix it. We can fix it. Why aren't we fixing it? Amen. Amen to everything he just said. Let me tell you why. Um, look, I'm a conservative Republican. I believe in, in business and capitalism and free enterprise, but I want to say to all of the communication companies, quit fighting for territory and quit fighting for market share and get down, offer your technologies, and I want to say to the politicians in D.C., forget about which companies in your district or in your state, get over that, adopt the technology, and give it to the state and locals. It's there. But there's too much infighting going on about who gets credit for what. It's absurd. Uh, Mr. Brown, there now, it's now been more than a year since Katrina did its devastation. To this day, there's still more than 100,000 people who are unable to go back to New Orleans because their homes have not been rebuilt or for whatever reason. Most of these people are very poor. Most of them are also dark-skinned. To what extent do you think that there would have been a different reaction both then and now if these people who were not able to go back to their homes today were middle class or wealthier and were not dark-skinned but were white? Well, first of all, I, I disagree with the premise of your question. Uh, that's because if we focus solely upon New Orleans, then your premise is correct. But we have to remember that Katrina covered a 90,000 square mile area. So there are just as many, I think there's one consistent theme across that 90,000 square mile area, and that's economic status. And it is a lot of poor people in that region. But it is poor whites, it is poor minorities, it crosses all social economic demographics. But here's why I think it's not recovering as quickly. George Will said it best a couple of weeks ago. What happens now is we're in this recovery process but if I want to, first of all, the, the, most homeowners who have insurance are now fighting with the insurance companies about whether or not their homes were damaged by wind or water. Well, the, the policies exclude water, but will cover wind. But they were damaged actually by the water, which was brought in by the wind. All right? So you know that the firms are making a lot of money out there you know, litigating these issues. A uh, court in Mississippi just recently ruled that it was wind damage that... that uh, that they're liable for and not for the water damage. So a lot of insureds are going to be very, very unhappy with their companies. But so you have that battle going on. Then you have the battle, particularly in, in the New Orleans area, of historic preservation, of environmental statements. So we have, we've built in all these regulations that we think are good in normal times, but they're totally inapplicable in times of a, dis of a disaster. And so we ought to develop some sort of mechanism that says, look, this is a catastrophic event. We all love historic preservation, but right now it's more important to get people in homes. It's all about priorities, and the government's not willing to change priorities. The government's not flexible enough to change its priorities. And we need to develop some sort of emergency regulatory system that says within these parameters, when these events occur, these regulations go out the window so people can rebuild and get back in their homes. I will say this. There is not a man or a woman that I know of within FEMA that ever responded to a disaster within the, in the back of their mind looking at someone about whether they were black or white, rich or poor, Republican or Democrat. The men and women of FEMA are all, are all about helping their fellow citizens. They're not about trying to play a political game. And unfortunately, 
Louisiana was the first time in my five and a half years in Washington where I saw politics interfere with a disaster response. Mr. Brown, you were eloquent in your description of the problems of working five levels down in a bureaucracy. What should Congress do about that, and where will the initiative come to promote some change? Well, there is, I think the smartest thing to do is to pull FEMA out of the Department of Homeland Security and once again make it an independent agency. I had high hopes for that occurring, say, three or four months ago when you had both Hillary Clinton and Trent Lott signing off on the same bill. It's either that or the end of the world, okay? I don't know which, which is true. I still think there's hope that even though the Senate has kind of capitulated, um, I think, to the White House, because the White House doesn't want to admit that maybe DHS was a mistake and we need to kind of unwind it a little bit. But on the House side, you still have people fighting vigorously for FEMA. I, right here in Ohio, Congressman Law Tourette, who I think was way ahead of his, his time in terms of what needed to be done. I mean, back before 9-11, he was advocating strengthening FEMA to respond to terrorism, but doing it within FEMA. But he couldn't get any traction with the bill. So on the House side, there's still that hope. And I think the smartest thing to do is, I had this old professor one time that kept telling me that things just at some point get so big that they're unwieldy. And I think the department has reached that, that tipping point where it's so big it's unwieldy. And the smartest thing to do is pull FEMA back out and let it continue to do what it did prior to going into the department. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Uh, you say that uh, you attribute a lot of the problems of uh, recovery to uh, bureaucracy, but during Katrina and in its immediate aftermath, the whole world watched the people dying and did not, we did not get what looked like a vigorous response from the president in previous disasters, earlier presidents would rush to the scene on day one. It took a long time to get there, and as was pointed out, there are many, many people who still have not received the kinds of uh, support that they <coughs> would expect. I'm wondering, can you comment on why the president didn't smash through these bureaucratic barriers and provide leadership that could have saved lives and helped the recovery? Look, I've announced, and I think it's no, it's no secret that obviously I'm a political appointee being confirmed by the United States Senate. Uh, I'm a Republican. Uh, I love George W. Bush, although I'm probably a little ticked off at him at times. Um, let, let me tell you, um, I'm very disappointed in the president. I think had I done what I, in answer to this question earlier, about having gone public with how bad things were, perhaps the president would have landed Air Force One that first day instead of looking out the window. Whoever let that picture be taken of him peering out the window at New Orleans, they ought to be fired. I mean, that was just stupid. The president should have landed that day. That would have given me, going back to TR, that would have given me the bully pulpit to say to the rest of the departments and agencies, HHS and DOT and all the others, that I need help. I, I can't answer why, and I don't know why, the president wasn't engaged. I, we had a secure video conference call Tuesday morning after landfall in which I told the president that I thought it was my estimation that 90% of New Orleans had been displaced and flooded. And he seemed surprised by that and, and basically told the rest of the cabinet to give me whatever I needed. But if you follow my email trails, other than how good I look or the dinners and all of that garbage, you will see an email on Friday where on Tuesday after that call, I had assigned a mission assignment to give all logistical support over to the Department of Defense. Yet on Friday, I'm still asking, where's the Army? I'm literally asking in the email, where's the Army? And I think it's because, one, the disaster was so big, it took them a long time. I mean, even General Honore, who I just love and admire, even Honore will tell you, it took him time to move, move in because of the lack of infrastructure, no roads, roads blocked, power lines down. So it took him a while to move in. I also think our perspective has been skewered. We turn on our TVs one morning and see that we've invaded Iraq. And we think that happens overnight. And it doesn't. To move logistically enough manpower and resources in to cover a 90,000 square mile area takes time. It took too long, but it didn't need to take as long as it did take. Mr. Brown, we know 
hurricanes that are going to hit Florida and the Gulf Coast. We know there's earthquakes that are going to hit California. We know there's forest fires. Let's look forward for a moment. What is your prediction as to where the next major disasters are going to hit us? And how well prepared are we now to deal with those disasters? Anita. The great Karnak says, <laughs> no, it's, it's, a, it's a serious question. Everyone who goes into public service wants to leave some legacy behind. I certainly didn't want to leave the one I left behind. What I wanted to leave behind was catastrophic disaster planning because that's something FEMA had never done. So I went to the White House and went to Congress and asked for a $100 million program in which I identified eight of the largest, most catastrophic potential events we might be faced with this, in this country and start along a process of doing that catastrophic planning. There were different scenarios, a Category 5 striking New Orleans, the New Madrid fault uh, breaking loose, the big one hitting California, a tsunami on the West Coast, a Category 5 going through uh, lower Manhattan, those kinds of, uh, you know, a, a smallpox uh, pandemic, those kinds of things. I wanted to do the planning so we would, one, identify our vulnerabilities and our lack of capacity, and then build a program that filled, that solved those vulnerabilities and built those capacities to deal with that. Congress cut me back to $80 million and gave me one project, and then cut the money out to continue the project. That project was called Hurricane Pam, and the report was given to me mid-July mid 2005. The scenario was a Category 5 striking New Orleans, and how do we deal with that catastrophic event? I got the report from the tabletop exercise mid-July that said, here are the 250 problems that we're going to face in this catastrophic event that need to be fixed. Great, let's get started. I couldn't get the money for it. And I had a United States Senator, how she got elected to asking this question, I don't know. This Senator actually asked me, well, Mr. Brown, you got the report in July of 05. Why didn't you have those things fixed by the time Katrina hit? <laughs> you laugh. She seriously, she asked me that question. Susan Collins of Maine. Absolutely unbelievable, in my opinion. And then they stand up and they talk about they're going to fix FEMA because FEMA needs to have a direct report to the president. And yet, they accuse me of having bypassed the chain of command by reporting directly to the president. I mean, this is the kind of politics that's going on in D.C., unfortunately, sometimes within our own party, that I think needs to come to a halt. Those are the kinds of disasters that we, that we are going to face. And that's why I refuse to go away and continue to speak out, because we have to address those things or shame on us. It appears that one of the biggest disasters looming in front of us is global warming. It, the scientific community does agree that it is a fact, and that these increased number of hurricanes are a symptom of, of that. I was wondering if you could give us some insight into this administration's recognition of this fact and what steps they are taking now to prepare for it. Well, first of all, I, I'm not sure I buy your premise that the community generally recognizes this. I mean, I was reading something just in the past couple of days about a study that shows the, the average temperature during the Dust Bowl versus the average temperature now and how we're actually lower right now. And hurricane season, although it's getting close to being over, hasn't been nearly as severe as last year. So I'm not sure I buy the theory that, that humans are so arrogant that we control the temperature of the universe. I don't doubt that we affect it, but I'm not sure that we control it and impact it that much. But that debate's for the scientists to have and then for the politicians to react to. I don't think that there is any reaction on the part of this administration. Uh, whether that's good or bad, I'm, I'm indifferent. I'm just saying I don't think they react to it. Uh, Mr. Brown. But I couldn't resist arguing with you about it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, th there's some sense that this country is subsidizing uh, areas that are going to be hit by disasters over and over again. For example, in Florida, you've got hurricanes that go through every year. They destroy homes, and yet we devote all sorts of resources down there. Should there be some sort of special tax or something so that people actually bear the cost and the rest of the country is not subsidizing growth in areas that are prone to storms and other natural disasters? That is a great question, and let me tell you why. 
you know, Courtney in her introduction or somebody in their introduction day talks about how Michael Brown handled over 160 presidential disaster declarations. Wow, that's impressive, isn't it? 160. There are probably 160 disasters going on in the country right now that FEMA doesn't get involved with. And the biggest philosophical problem I had as the FEMA director is that an ice storm might blow through um, Ohio and it would get declared, but yet because of the population or something. But a tornado might rip through a small town in Wyoming and we don't do anything. The other thing that always irritated me was in my home state of Colorado, we had, I was going to, one of my other legacies was no dough for snow. No dough for snow. Do you realize that the American taxpayers subsidize the removal of record snowfalls, even in places like my hometown of Boulder, Colorado? Which means if Boulder last year got 20 inches of snow on any given 24-hour period, and this year it gets 20.2 inches, we're going to pay for the removal of that snow for that 24-hour period. Now, why should we be doing that? You see, I think we need to rethink the whole economic impact of disaster relief and what it means for the taxpayers in one part of the country to be subsidizing taxpayers in the other part of the country and some who, just because of geography or population, will never get relief because of the size of the community. We're not willing to address those questions, and I think that we should. The National Flood Insurance Program, it subsidizes. Why should we have, we should have some sort of repetitive loss clause that says, okay, you can, you can rebuild there once, and we'll pay for it under the NFIP, the Flood Insurance Program, but if it floods again because you're still in a flood zone, you're on your own. Why should we continue to subsidize it? There are great questions that are not being debated. Mr. Brown, you partially answered my question when you were speaking about where was the Army uh, at the time. But I'm curious, does, did FEMA then or does it now have any relationship or any authority over the National Guard? Why couldn't the National Guard have driven the, the trucks that the contractors pulled over to the side of the road to, to help the people on an immediate basis? Well, and, and in fact, that was, that was the purpose of the mission assignment was so that DOD and National Guard would start doing that. Uh, FEMA does not have control over the National Guard. FEMA is basically a giant automatic teller machine, and we're a basic orchestra conductor of making sure we coordinate all of the other assets of the federal government to where they are needed and where they can take place. One of the things that I recommended, uh, I think it was by Tuesday or Wednesday, I was recommending to the president that we actually invoke the Insurrection Act, even with all the posse comitatus ramifications that has, and federalize the disaster. In other words, take over the entire disaster. One of the reasons for doing that was that part of the, new, uh, the Louisiana National Guard itself was a victim of the disaster. Uh, in uh, Jackson Quarters, uh, they, they were stranded. They saw the floodwaters rise, and they couldn't get out. So it was just this plethora of problems that just continued to pile one upon the other. And so without the incident command system, without the communications, Without the state, the local, and the feds, it was just everything caved in on itself. Mr. Brown, um, I, I've just left the company, uh, I retired, and uh, they have over a thousand employees. And one of the tenants that is expressed constantly is uh, perception is reality. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, part of the perception that I'm hearing. Uh, I, I don't like, and that is that there was such trouble in the dome uh, by some lawless people, but nothing was done about it. And it just as the person before me asked, I don't understand why the National Guard wasn't called in to help and get and take care of those lawless people so that a whole group aren't labeled with, with what a few people did. That is so true. Let me give you two contrasting examples. Haley Barber's reaction to, loiter, uh, to looting and violence in Mississippi was this. If you loot, you can shoot. You can shoot the looters. If you get prosecuted for shooting a looter and you're found guilty, I will pardon you. That's Haley's reaction. In other words, you loot, you're going to get shot, and if that guy gets prosecuted, I'm going to pardon you. So don't be shooting, don't be doing this stuff. Governor Blanco's response to the looters was, isn't that awful? 
Now look, I like Governor Blanco, and, and, but, but it's about leadership. That's exactly why I started asking for the federalizing of troops so that we could move troops into not just the Superdome, which is what you saw on television, but the convention center where there was no food, there was no water, and people from foreign countries were evacuating out of hotels into the convention center along with people out of the streets of New Orleans, creating not only this cultural clash, but nothing or no one to help them. Totally unacceptable. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we have been listening to Michael Brown, former director of the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. Television broadcast of the City Club Forum is made possible in part by National City. We provide financial solutions for individuals and businesses in seven Midwestern states and selected markets nationally. At National City, we care about doing what's right for our customers. John Carroll University, educating undergraduate and graduate students to be leaders in business and technology, education, the sciences, and many other fields. John Carroll University, strong Jesuit tradition, solid education, sound future. Nordson Corporation, a world leader in systems that apply adhesives, sealants, and coatings during manufacturing operations to make today's products work better and last longer.